Okay, so we continue for the second talk on Christology. Uh, just during the break, uh, someone asked a question, raised a question, what about with Jacob? I said Jacob neglected his role and duty as a father uh, to name his 12 sons. And the person asked, well, what about his last son, uh, who is Benjamin? And uh, he, he actually did take an initiative on that one, so thank you for <laughs> mentioning that. Because his mother, uh, what was her name now, Rachel, she said, uh, Ben Oni, she died, in, uh, he died, sorry, she died, sorry, in um, childbirth. And so Ben Oni is uh, my affliction. So Ben Oni is son of my affliction. And Jacob finally takes charge and says, Lo Ben Oni, uh, Ben Yamin. Um, so not son of my affliction, but son of my right hand. And Benjamin is, is his baby but he's son of my right hand. So that's the privileged position and so forth, very important. Any other questions on what we talked about before? And then we'll continue on how is the son of God man? Because this is, you know, we continue wrestling with the question and, and getting more deeply into it. Okay, no more questions? Very good. Let's look at, and the catechism here looks at the you know, several different things. So, Christ's soul and his human knowledge. <coughs> Two, Christ's human will. And Christ's true body. And the heart of the incarnate word. So, Christ's soul and his human knowledge. In having a true human nature, like ours, in all things except sin. This means that Christ uh, had a soul and a body. So he was, whatever, the man Jesus. His soul is the soul of the man Jesus and kept alive, kept in existence by the person of the Word. The soul, now knowledge comes to the human person. So we'll go from how we know to work backwards then to how God knows. God knows through the knowledge in the human person comes through our experience, okay? And that's how we learn. It comes through our human nature. For God, he go, God knows through his divine nature. Angelic persons know through their angelic nature. But we know through experience of our human nature. And in <coughs> Jesus, because there are two natures, therefore there are two sources of knowledge. In his divinity... What sort of things did he know? Love. Father, right? Anything else? Or maybe I should ask the question in another way. Was there anything he did not know? In his divinity? No, in his divinity. Absolutely not. He's God, equal. He knew everything that the Father knows. So when Jesus, for instance, says about the times to come and the end of the world and all of that, and say, when will this happen? Jesus says, uh, it is not for you to know times and seasons that the Father has established by his own authority. He's not saying, I don't know. In my divinity, I do know. But I'm not, I'm not telling you, and because it's not right for you to know. No. Anyway, so in his divinity, he knew everything. That's the simple bit. In his humanity, now... His humanity, because he is united with the person of the word, I'm going to write this down, in a very special bond. And it's called a hypostatic union. Now, I'm going to write it out, and I'm going to tell you what it means. So, right, so... Um, <clears throat> Hypostatic union refers to the union between the human and the divine. That the, that the human is united in one person. And that person is a what kind of person? Divine. A divine person. Right? <coughs> divine person. I'm going to keep drilling you on the correct terminology so you, you get the terminology and you'll catch yourselves out when you use an incorrect terminology. Like human person, 
and human being. He is not a human person. He is not a human being. He is human, but he is a divine person. Hypostatic union refers to the unity between the human and divine nature in the one person of the word. Hypostatic comes from two Greek words, hypostasis, which means to stand under. So the hypostasis is, uh, is basically referring to the person. Now, because you've got a human nature who is united to a divine nature and to this person of the word, completely united, not mixed, not confused, completely united, he knows all things in what we call the beatific vision. <coughs> the beatific vision is the vision of God. And this is what we are all promised in heaven. We will have the beatific vision. We will see God. And this can't happen now because we don't have the mind and the heart for it. God has to raise us. And at that moment in heaven, what will happen is our minds will receive the form of God to, to be able to uh, appreciate him and drink him in and understand him, but always with a finite mind. This capacity that we will have will be bound or restricted or proportional to the degree of merit that we will have. So the holier we become, the more merit we gain by doing acts of love, acts of faith, acts of hope, then our merit grows. And this then expands our capacity, and to that degree we will be able to drink in the vision of God. What so acts of charity, Father? Acts of charity is acts of love. I'm using them uh, similar, like uh, interchangeably. It, it, acts of charity are more is more precise, but acts of love is accurate as well. Acts of love means typically, it could mean philanthropy, that's an act of love, or I can mean an act of love of God, whereas acts of charity is exclusively acts of love of God. Uh, so charity is love of God, right? the first of the virtues. Now, all of these things will increase my merit. Who is the human being that has ever merited the most? That we know of. <coughs> Our Lady, right? Mary, Mother Mary. So her knowledge of God, the beatific vision, is astonishing. And we will <coughs> be mesmerized as we look at her own greatness when we get to heaven. But when you look at Christ, and you now have this human nature who is united to divinity, united to divinity. He has an absolute vision of God. His beatific vision is absolute. It cannot be anything but that. It's, it's the result of this hypostatic union. So Our Lady has a limited, finite knowledge of God. Christ is infinite. So here we have a finite mind is able to drink in the infinity of God. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? It shows how exalted human nature is. That human nature is capable of being united with God in a unity of person. That's astonishing. Anyway, that's the Savior. That's God's crazy, radical plan to save us. So just hold on for a second. So then, he, the beatific vision of God is, of Christ, sorry, is perfect knowledge of God. Carry on. What did Adam have before the fall? Adam was not, did not have the beatific vision. He had a knowledge of God. The, uh, we'll actually cover this in the talk on creation. Okay, so uh, he had the, what they call the four preternatural gifts. A simple acronym to remember them is K triple I. So knowledge, integrity, immortality, impassibility. I'll explain these when we get to that. But he, but he, his knowledge was not a result of a unity of nature, of a hypostatic unity. That is a, a unity that only a knowledge that only comes in the case of Christ. See, Our Lady is divinized by grace, but she is not divine by nature. Only one person is like that. That's the divine person, and that's only one human nature is like that, and that's Christ. 
So then he has this beatific vision. He also, we know from the scriptures, that there is infused knowledge. St. John tells us and the other this, uh, evangelists that the son, in fact, uh, Jesus did not need to be told what was in a man. He knew already what was inside. <coughs> or another place, Jesus knew what they were thinking. How do you know what you're thinking? <laughs> That's got to be revealed to you, right? Now, here we're not talking about intuition. Intuition, you know, you've all experienced intuition, you know, particularly the women. You know something, you know, and uh, and while men and women can both be intuitive, but often, and they say, oh, it's this, it's that. You think, how do you know that? Oh, I don't know, <laughs> but it's and it often ends up being true, right? Um, about ninety-five percent of the time. And uh, but anyway, so but it's not intuition. Intuition, in fact, it is. Uh, it, there's an infused knowledge there. Now, this infused knowledge could also come from his beatific vision. But St. Thomas Aquinas talks about infused knowledge because there are cases of it. But I frankly don't think that is actually so necessary that there be that we actually postulate or or say that there's another source of knowledge that can easily come as an overflow from his beatific vision. Then there's a third kind of knowledge, and that's called experiential knowledge or experimental knowledge. And this is very important. St. Luke, when he talks about Jesus as a, a boy of 12, he goes from the temple, you know, he stays there for three days, and he says, and he went home and lived under their authority. And the boy grew in wisdom and in favor with God and men. So he grew. Now the way in which Jesus grows, his knowledge grew. Jesus learned how to, well, I don't know, Probably they didn't use a knife and fork, but he had to learn how to eat. He had to learn how to do a trade. He had to learn how to speak. He had to learn how to read. Learn how to play soccer or whatever games the other Hebrew children played. He had to learn all those things. And that's, that, that, that's no, uh, that's nothing radical, right? I mean, that's we all go through that experience. So in the case of learning though, let's go in a bit further, what's happening in the process of learning? We are going from a position of ignorance to a position of knowledge. And I don't mean here ignorance in the pejorative sense of, of mockery or something, just strictly in the Greek origin, without knowledge. Ignorance, agnon. So I go from ignorance to knowledge. So there's a process there where I, I go from unknowing to knowing. And Jesus also went through that process. Jesus, is, so that's in terms of his knowledge. So he learned, for instance, what, but the problem then comes is, okay, you've got, this is the knowledge that comes through his human nature. He's already got this thing that's kind of problematic for us to make sense of him because he's got a beatific vision. From the moment of his conception, Christ had all the fullness of God and knowledge of him. So you might think, hang on a minute, <laughs> he hasn't even got a brain developed, you know? How on earth can this come about? It's a mystery. But it cannot be any other way, because his humanity began to exist at the moment of conception. As soon as Our Lady said, let it be done to me according to thy will, the Holy Spirit came upon her and he took, you know, as a cell, one of her ovum, and uh, ovum, sorry, and it was fertilized. It was, it was now became the Son of God. And, I mean, I'll talk about these sort of questions a bit in the creation uh, uh, talk. But from that moment on, the person of the Word existed in her womb. And this humanity that had the beatific vision. So clearly, so there's a, a huge mystery there. But in terms of what I think really helps us is that the boy Jesus grew and he, his father, Joseph, had to show him, for instance, how to use a plane, how to build a table. And part of learning is that you don't get it always right from the beginning. You make mistakes. 
Did Jesus, just, did St. Joseph just show him how to hit a nail and he always got it right? I reckon sometimes he hit the wrong nail and he says, ouch, you know, and, uh, and did that. I'm sure sometimes he put splinters into his hands. That's part of the human experience. So anything that we can say about him that is part of our human experience, that is not the result of sin, we also apply it to Christ. This is part of his own experience. Did he dream? Yes. He felt hunger, he cried, he laughed, he drank, he felt <coughs> cold, he felt heat, he felt whatever. He was annoyed, and sometimes he felt boredom, whatever it is. All of those things that we can say that are not as a result of sin, he experienced them as well. So we've got all this human nature that is like us, we've got divine nature, and how the two come together. Oh my God. That's exactly right. We're talking about God and He is mysterious. The Incarnation is an extraordinary mystery, second only to the mystery of the Trinity. You know, firmly I believe and truly God is three and one is one, and I next acknowledge duly manhood taken by the Son. There's a hierarchy in the truths of the Catholic faith, and the Incarnation is the second most mysterious. Yes? That right. passage in Scripture where it says He became perfect through suffering, Yes, good, uh, which shows that he had to learn. And that was a particular way of learning. That's in the letter to the Hebrews. It's not always perfect. It's just, Sorry? It's not always perfect. I find that a very hard one to understand. He became perfect through suffering. He, he learned to obey through suffering, is I think mm -hmm. the actual thing. I don't have the Greek text in front of me, but I, he, became, um, he learned to obey through suffering, which meant a certain perfection, that he had, he had to grow in that. And, and that's part of his, part of his uh, yeah, growing as, as in humanity. And specifically, growing through suffering, mm -hmm. which shows us that though he was son, he learned to obey through suffering. Mm -hmm. The son had to learn something through suffering. And uh, it's not just us who suffer. Mm -hmm. I mean, he suffered the worst, uh, mm -hmm. and yet he was the most innocent. He suffered the terrible agony on the cross. And... But yeah, that, that whole... Someone asked a question in one of the other classes, actually, so one of the university students, and said, we, we refer to Christ as the perfect man. And he is a perfect man. But in what sense do we mean Christ is the perfect man? Well, he's perfect in virtue. So he had the highest virtue in all the virtues in every conceivable way. But... And he obviously, and in, in Christ, while he grew in his knowledge, though, in other ways, there was a limit to him. If there were no limit, then he couldn't possibly be human. For example, could Christ be, I assume he would have been a handsome man, but could he have been more beautiful still? What do you think? Is there a contradiction if we said Christ could have been more beautiful. Is there anything that, uh, are we denying any doctrine about his authenticity as sharing in human nature? We're not denying it. Could he have been more intelligent? Did he have to be the smartest human who walked the earth? No, not necessarily. Did he have to, he, he could have spoken 15 languages. Some people can. I've actually met someone who, speaks, what did he say to me? He yeah. speaks seven languages and reads and understands 17. Whoa. Some Russian, uh, I met him in America, I thought, whoa, you know? This guy. So some people are incredibly gifted, you know? I'm not sure if he could do anything else to save his soul, that guy, but uh, he uh, <laughs> but he could certainly be pretty good at speaking languages, you know? So, uh, but I, I, mean, I just say that, that Christ could have been more intelligent. There's no... Uh, could he have been stronger? Yes. If he didn't have a limit to his strength, could he have died? No. He had to have a limit to his strength. Now, I imagine he would have been a pretty hefty guy. I mean, a carpenter, he walked everywhere he went. But the strong man in the scriptures is Samson, the Old Testament. Uh, yes. Yes, Paul. I thought the limitations on his ability would be in his humanity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
And that's what we're talking. We talk about Christ as the perfect man. So what does that mean? So he's perfect in virtue. He's perfect in holiness. But in the other physical attributes, he had limits, like us, in everything. And uh, he... Another question, though, what about the holiness in Christ, his sanctification? We talk, Jesus grew in knowledge, but did he grow in holiness? Well, I think he had to grow in holiness, but because he's, he's the Son of God. Bingo. Bingo. He didn't have to grow in holiness. He is immediately sanctified to the point, actually, he's divinized when he is united with the person of the Word. So Jesus, while we grow in holiness, while Mother Mary grew in holiness, he did not. He became instantly, he became divine at the moment of conception, of Our Lady's conception of him. And uh, yeah, so that's just, again, but that's just one of those things that we have to be careful. We don't think just because he's like us in every other way, so we think, oh, well, we grow in holiness, therefore he grew in holiness. No, he grew in knowledge. He grew in wisdom, in his humanity, always in his humanity, right? You've got to keep saying that. And then he, but he uh, did not grow in holiness. So as a boy, he was always divine, always divine. Yes, when, question. When Jesus was lost in the temple, yes. he, he walked away from his parents because he felt this was his mission to, to preach. Uh, was that a conflict between his humanity, perhaps, and his... Um, well, that's one of the other things that in the way the human, his human nature was a sinless human nature, so it was completely aligned with the will of God. Just as in the case of Our Lady, her human nature was not divine, but completely sinless. So, so full of grace was she that at every single moment she did what the Holy Spirit was prompting her to do. In the case of Christ, we have now this quantum leap that this human nature was united perfectly with the nature of the Son of God, the person of the Son of God. So we cannot actually say that. So there was no misfiring in the boy Jesus. So therefore, in coming to terms with that passage, we've got to understand that somehow the boy Jesus was swept up in the whole awe and wonder of being in the Father's house. And it's said that he, he just got caught up in it. He would have been taught to respect his father and mother, the fourth commandment, uh, completely. And he, so there would have been, it's inconceivable that he had a thought that he's just going to be a rebellious kid and, you know, give his mother and father a bit of a heartache. That's how a, an immature 12-year-old uh, would, would act. So therefore, and it's a beautiful point in Christ's life. It's the point when we first hear that Christ's, own awareness is that Joseph wasn't his father and he makes that known and that in fact God is his father and but he having said that he goes and lives under the authority of his human father and mother and even when uh, Mary is says do you not know my child that your father and I have been worried Jesus doesn't even say he's not my father to Joseph, he says, "Did you not? Why were you worried? Did you not know that I must be about my father's house?" Oh, he's talking about a different father here, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, good question. Thanks. Could you say he was led by the Spirit? Absolutely, absolutely. So, he's going into the wilderness at the start of his ministry. It wasn't the first time he was led by the Spirit. Oh no, he was constantly led by the Spirit. Yeah, mm -hmm. the anointing, by the way. Yeah, that's a good point. The anointing with Christ, we talked about in the beginning. Okay, when he goes to his public ministry, he's 30 years old and so forth, is a symbolic anointing. The fact is, he was anointed from the moment of his conception. It's precisely by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. Right? So, he, that was the anointing. It's, there was never a moment, put it this way, there was never a moment in Christ's life, in the womb or outside of the womb, where he wasn't anointed completely, perfectly by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's just that for his human nature to grow, there had to be a gradualness there. 
uh, a gradual actualizing of that humanity. And, and that's very mysterious for us, okay? Uh, it's the way we will come to know this is to know these doctrinal things about Christ. <coughs> but then as we start to talk to him more and more, and we all do in prayer, and particularly a reverence towards him and devotion to him in the Blessed Sacrament, we come to know that this Christ, how he intervenes in our lives. And we see that he knows all things and at the same time, he is tender and loving and understanding and merciful as it shows itself to us in our lives. And that's the, beautif the beauty of a life of faith in Christ. Can I say something? Yeah. Now, when that story does come to the children, yes. now, a lot of children say that Jesus was disobedient and he wasn't considerate for his mum and dad. Yes. And I say, it's true. I really do, because I, well, it depends how you look at it. Now, if he was God, and I mean, we do believe that he was God, now he should have known that his parents would have been so concerned. I mean, he, he left them, and they took off, and he was by himself. Of course parents would be concerned. I mean, yeah. I would be concerned as a mum. Yeah. So therefore, him being God should have realised that this was going to put a lot of pressure on his foster father and his mum. Yep. How sad. Yeah. So therefore, it therefore. sounds it sounds like he was disobedient. It exactly right. Good. So <laughs> now I'll proceed to show you where the mistake is in the, in that line because we always and and thank you for that question because it's it's important and this is and I could imagine that a lot of twelve year old you know year six kids would be thinking hang on a minute, so not only are you trying to preserve a correct understanding of what happened there that's in keeping with the doctrine, but then knowing how to pass that on to the children in a way that they can understand, or at least begin to understand. So the point is, you're right, if he's God, then he would have realized or should have realized that it's going to cause an inconvenience to his parents. What do we know? We know that he is God. Therefore, uh, and, and yet he still stayed behind. Was this therefore as a result of disobedience or could there be another explanation of what the boy child, the child Jesus did? If disobedience is a sin and Christ could not sin, then it couldn't be disobedience. It has to be another explanation. If there is evidence for disobedience, then we have to find that. But the reality is, there is no evidence for it. Therefore, that line of explanation is going to a dead end. Then, what's the other explanation then that there could be for it? That, in fact, the Holy Spirit swept him up so that his mind wasn't thinking about his parents at that time, but rather thinking about his father's house. That would have been the first time, more than likely, when Jesus was brought to the temple. Children up to that point, you know, the, the Jews now have the bar mitzvah, and that's, you know, the, at the age of 12, then the uh, kind of considered as a, a young adult in the faith. So, up to, but under the age of 12, the boys, or the girls, they could travel with each of the caravans. The men and the women would travel as men and women, so anyone, and so every year after that, Jesus would have been brought <coughs> to the temple, and he would have travelled with the men, and obviously there would have been learning from that experience, which no doubt brought heartache to his parents. But at that moment, he was swept up into something mysterious, that the awe, awe and wonder of being in the Father's house, that he was just carried away by that, and that's not inconceivable to see that. And it also makes sense then with what he says after that. We don't know, for instance, what further conversations, and I imagine they must have happened. So this is now three days later, where Mary and Joseph are saying, so my son, tell us, what else? What were you doing there? And we are told after he said, did you not know that I must be about my father's affairs, my father's house? The Greek is a bit uncertain. You can sort of translate it both ways. We're told, but they did not understand. But as for Mary, she pondered these things in her heart. 
Now, why on earth do you ponder things in your heart? Well, because that's the only thing you can do at that point. But as you ponder, you also come to understand the mystery. And Mary, as she pondered these things, came to understand the mystery. But I have no doubt that at some point later, if not on the trip home, they would have talked to him and said, so tell us, what did you do? What was happening? Where did you eat? Oh, I met these lovely rabbis or whoever, and they shared with me things, and we were talking about this. Oh, and he, I don't know. I imagine they would have been talking to them about the scriptures. And remember, again, a lot of people think that Jesus was sitting there and just holding court. That is inconceivable to a Hebrew mind and also to a boy who would have been taught a great respect for the religious authorities. He would, what I imagine would have happened in that whole episode is, and, and I actually cover this in, in the infancy narrative um, talks, the, that you know, they would have taught their teaching, whatever it was, and then Jesus would have had different insights to them. And he would have asked them questions about that. So if that's the case, what about such and such? And they're scratching their head and thinking, yeah, actually, it could, it could be that. I had never thought about that. So they're astonished at his questions and his replies. And I imagine they would have talked about all of these experiences. Uh, he would have slept there. It wouldn't have been uncommon uh, that children would have slept there. That they're there for their pilgrimage, remember? And they would have just assumed, you know, they're in the temple and, you know, so that's... Uh, but there's, obvious, there's a lot of unknown. And that's room for us all in our prayer to meditate on. But whenever you come to a conclusion that is leading Christ to sin, well, that can't be. So, there must, so then start looking. That's where the doctrine protects us. Mm -hmm. Come looking then, or start looking, for another explanation. And we'll get to some of these questions about the conception of Jesus as well. Quickly, because uh, we're, um, time is uh, marching on and doesn't wait for anyone, Christ's human will okay, was perfectly like ours, but without suffering any of the faults or any of the uh, weakness of human will influenced by original sin. Okay, so, but in every, and this is in the Council of Constantinople, the Third Council of Constantinople, 681 AD, so we're in the 7th century, uh, the Church confessed that Christ possessed two wills and two natural operations, divine and human. So the human, the divine operation, we, we know that, but the human operation. And this is mysterious. How does he, so when Christ, for instance, went to teach, did he just go blah, 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 open his mouth and oh yeah he, he was you know someone asked him a, a curious question and then he just comes out with this magnificent parable and just wow and just knocks them for dead yeah. of course he had to think he had to prepare himself what about this and he'll take analogies from that and I don't know but I imagine maybe he may have bounced things off his mother perhaps there were things that maybe he talked about various things with his disciples I don't know privately <coughs> but Jesus would have thought about what he's going to say. And it's part of learning. And parables was the way he chose to teach the most, uh, in which he chose to, to teach the most, because it has many lessons that can be drawn from it. And But anyway, that's the operation of how his mind thought. His mind had no weakness again. There's no dullness. But the mind also uh, operated like our minds do. So, uh, you know, I mean, Sigmund Freud is attributed often with this, and, and Carl Jung, the, the conscious, subconscious, and unconscious <coughs> mind. So, you know, there's a, a conscious mind of what we're aware of, what we're thinking about, the subconscious, when things are registering on us emotionally, and then the unconscious mind. And the unconscious mind is the greater part of our mind. For instance, right now, I'm just going to have a stab in the dark, but I imagine most of you aren't thinking about the breakfast you had this morning. Am I right? Yeah. Was someone actually thinking about the breakfast? No. Okay, so that, but now it's conscious. <laughs> you are thinking about the breakfast because I've yes. brought it. So it's gone from your unconscious mind and gone to your conscious mind. Right? So the, the three, we're not operating conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. <coughs> now in Christ's mind, 
So he was able to retrieve things from his unconscious mind by use of the memory it, it very naturally, very conveniently. In our case, there are things locked away in our unconscious mind because of sin. And that is where, as we grow in our spiritual lives, Christ's grace unlocks those moments in our history. Often moments of suffering, of pain, where our mind couldn't cope with the particular suffering. And so at that moment, there's a blockage. It rather would not remember it because it can't cope with it. And then someone typically will have a trauma or something tragic happens and it breaks something into that past and all these memories start flooding forth. So the whole phenomenon of repressed memory. In Christ's case, there was no repressed memory because his human nature was perfect in every way. There was no darkness as a result of sin. And so he could access these things from his childhood. Since when? How far back could he remember? I don't know. Okay, but I've heard mem I've heard children who've gone back and have memories even as far as 18 months. And that's astonishing. I mean, my earliest memories I'd be maybe two and a half years, three, and just images. But now can you imagine Christ, a perfect human nature, no sin? I imagine things start to develop pretty soon, right? But again, I, don't, I won't say any more than that, but I'll just say that's the direction which the doctrine that we know points to. I imagine the case of Our Lady, the tradition there is that at the age of three, she went and gave herself in the temple, offered herself. How could someone have reached the age of reason at the age of three? Well, let me tell you. To us, it sounds really bizarre, but let's take a few a quick analogies of cases that we may know. I don't know, in my experience, I've seen children who've been raised in devout Catholic families, children who raised in moderately practicing families, and children in non-practicing families. And I find that children in devout practicing families typically are more attuned and aware to the spiritual things. It makes sense. So, for instance, children as young as the age of six have reached the age of reason. And I asked the parents when I asked them, you know, do you, uh, does the, um, have they reached the age of reason? And they don't know how to answer to that question. Do you think they're ready for the sacrament of, excuse me, first reconciliation or first communion? Well, I'm not sure. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Then I asked the, the bullseye question, if your child wanted to deceive you, can they? Well, yeah, absolutely. Bingo, they've, they've now gained the age of reason. There's no longer child simplicity. They are able to deceive me, so they've reached that point. And so at the age of six, I've seen that. I haven't seen anyone younger than that age. Uh, but doesn't mean I won't in the future. So that's in the case of a child who's a sinner who's been baptized. So a child now who doesn't need baptism, Conceived without original sin, full of grace, I think we can go back to three without too much trouble. So anyway, but it's just important for us that in these things, there's a lot of mystery, but the foundation of human experience that we know, just put it on steroids, so to speak, and just without sounding blasphemous, but that's, and then you, the humanity of Christ, while preserving what we have, is actually more advanced again. Uh, Christ's hu true human body or true body. Since the Word became flesh in assuming a true humanity, Christ's body was finite, and therefore the human face of Jesus can be portrayed at the Seventh, seventh Ecumenical Council, Nicaea II, in 787, so the uh, 8th century. The Church recognized this representation in holy images to be legitimate. So remember the iconoclasts who wanted to destroy sacred imagery and all of that because they appealed to the Old Testament, thou shalt not have any graven images. And the church realized under the influence of the Holy Spirit, no, God has now got a face. He's human like us. Therefore, he can be portrayed in different ways. I, uh, I mean, I imagine that Christ would have been Semitic in, in his appearance. You know, he probably had dark eyes. Uh, you, but you see some Israelis nowadays 
who are obviously of Jewish blood, who would have blue eyes and fair hair. Now, I don't know if that's been cross genes from 20 centuries of mingling with other races or not. I don't know, but that's just what I imagine. If the image of the Shroud of Turin is something to go by, and it looks like more and more it's authentic, he would have looked very much like a darker skinned and so forth, which makes sense for a Palestinian in, in first century um, uh, in first century Palestine. Okie dokie. And the heart of, of the incarnate word, Jesus knew and loved us each and all during his life, his agony and his passion, and gave himself up for each one of us. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, says St. Paul in his letter to the Galatians. He has loved us all with a human heart. For this reason, the sacred heart of Jesus, pierced by our sins and for our salvation, is quite rightly considered the chief sign and symbol of that love with which the Divine Redeemer continually loves the Eternal Father and all human beings without exception. And this from Pope Pius XII's encyclical Haurietis Aquas. So I think my Latin's a bit rusty, but uh, um, Fountain of Water, something with that, but it's a, his letter on the Sacred Heart in 1956. He was conceived, we are told, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the Annunciation, so we're told he's born of the Virgin Mary. So now we consider in this paragraph Mary's predestination, how God prepared a fitting place for the birth of his son. We'll look at Mary's predestination, her immaculate conception, uh, her the Annunciation, Mary's divine motherhood, and Mary's virginity. And there's a lot of material. But anyway, it doesn't matter. We'll just get through as best we can. The uh, Mary, there are four dogmas on about Mary. So these are de teachings established what we call de fide, D-E, -E, separate word, F-I-D-E, means on the faith or concerning the faith. And all of these dogmas have to do about her because of her role as the mother of Jesus. So what are the four dogmas that we profess about Our Lady? This is essential to the Catholic faith. We cannot not believe them and still hold ourselves to be faithful Catholic Christians in communion with the Church. So what are they? Let's see if we can get them out. Yeah, right. Whoa, 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 one at a time. Just hands up, please. Uh, yep. Virgin original sin. So immaculate conception. Okay. Next. There's three more. Shoot in. Yeah. Mother of God. Mother of God. So that's the pinnacle of them. Everything that is all her privileges are because she's the mother of God, because she's birth of Jesus, mother of Jesus, and Jesus is God, therefore she's the mother of God. Okay, next. Full of grace. Uh, that's an attribute given to her, but it's not a dogma. It's straight from the scriptures. So, yes, if she's immaculately conceived, then she has to be full of grace. It's a consequence of that first dogma. Yes? Virginity. Yep, perpetual virginity. So she's ever virgin. We'll talk about what that means. And? Assumed into heaven. Assumed into heaven, the fourth one. Okay? So that's what the church has decreed upon right now, up till now. In the future, there may be other insights into the person of Our Lady. And the church may be led by the Holy Spirit to a sufficient degree of certainty where she now declares some of these teachings as a dogma. For example, in the Second Vatican Council, chapter 8 on Lumen Gentium, the chapter, the teaching on the church, the Our Lady was referred to as um, co-redeemer and mediatrix of grace and, and advocate as well. About, I don't know, 20 years ago, about 500 bishops from the, around the church had petitioned the Holy Father then, Pope John Paul, St. John Paul II, to declare the dogma, a fifth dogma of Our Lady, as mediatrix of all grace, <coughs> co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all grace, and advocate. But the Second Vatican Council didn't say mediatrix of all grace. It said mediatrix of grace. In other words, it is undeniable in the role of Our Lady in her life, of, in the life of her son, being intimately connected with him, 
at every step of the way that she actually wasn't a mediatrix of grace. Who kicks in our Lord's public ministry at the wedding feast of Cana? Our Lady. Our Lord may have realized that they were without wine, but he wasn't going to do anything about it. <laughs> it's Our Lady, the mother, notices they have no wine. Well, what's this got to do with me, woman? My hour has not yet come, you know? Pretty brazen, call, calling his mother woman, you know? But it's, uh, there's a meaning about that as well that John's bringing out because he also calls her woman when he's hanging from the cross. He doesn't call her, and in the Greek, woman, agunaika, means a woman or wife. So there's an interesting little catechesis there because on the cross, we're told the, the birth of the church took place from the side of Christ. And so Our Lady and Christ are in fact acting like spouses, so to speak, uh, because she is now the mother of the church. There's a giving birth there. But anyway, that's an interesting little reflection that we could have another time. So the, um, the advocate, now what happens is, the, the Our Lady is definitely an advocate, and she is a mediatrix of grace. The question is, is she a mediatrix of all grace? And that's what we do not know. That is, some people believe, yes, it is. There's a theological opinion. You can believe that she is. I personally do. I think she's a mediatrix of all grace because she's involved in Christ's life as a, in, in all sorts of ways, completely. And therefore, it doesn't make sense that she wasn't, uh, in fact, through this daughter of, of God, this greatest daughter of God, that she is, in fact, the grace of her son. It's always the grace of her son through the merits of his death and resurrection that also flows through her ministry in some way. But that's a theological opinion. It is not doctrine, and you are not bound to believe that. So you may just believe, well, some grace, it definitely is mediated through Our Lady's intercession, but other grace comes directly from God. That's fine, okay? But in the future, the church, sufficient theological work may be done where there is a consensus of some kind, or there's a big a cathartic moment in the church where there's a, a public brawl going on, basically, a debate, a heresy, and then Vatican III comes around, or Vatican XV, or whatever it is, the next ecumenical council, and the bishops together with the Pope get together and say, what does the church really believe about this or that teaching? And then they hammer it out, and then they'll make a pronouncement. So what I'm saying is these four dogmas of Our Lady are the dogmas that we know of so far. But remember that Jesus tells them about the Holy Spirit, that there are still many things I have to say to you, but they would be too much for you now. But the Spirit, the Advocate, whom I will send from the Father, will lead you, teach you everything, and lead you into the path of all truth. The Mother of God dogma was always believed from the very beginning. But it was declared in the Council of Ephesus, 431 AD. The virginity of Our Lady is there from the Scriptures. And we'll talk about that as well. I don't know what questions you may have about that. But the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption, where is the evidence for these from the Bible, <coughs> from the Scriptures? Can anyone point to something from the Scriptures? about the Immaculate Conception, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, or the dogma of the Assumption. Yes? Maybe when the angel Gabriel says you are full of grace. Okay, so you're full of grace. So it's pointing there. I said to yes. that lady there when she said, mm -hmm. another dogma of Our Lady is, is full of grace. Certainly that <coughs> flows from that. It, it points to it. Mm -hmm. But does it explicitly say that? In other words, mm -hmm. could she like John the Baptist was born sinless. Mm -hmm. Could she have been uh, full of grace? Now she's full of grace. Mm -hmm. Does that mean she was always full of grace? Mm -hmm. And that's the bit we don't know. So she's, when he said that to her, yeah, you're full of grace. So she was, I don't know, 15, 16 years old or whatever. And you're full of grace. Was she always that way? And, and the, so in other words, there's a, a question mark there. It certainly points in that direction, but it's not explicit. So, w this is the thing, by the way, in Catholic theology and Catholic doctrine, we should say what we can say, 
and no more than what we can say. Otherwise, our, the theological science becomes arrogant. It's, it's saying things that we cannot say. And by the way, academics do this all the time in order to sell a book, in order to make an impression, to get funding, whatever it happens to be. You know, people exaggerate their claims. No, that's dishonest. Say what we can say, stop still when we can't say any more. And that's okay. That's okay. But we know that what we do say and can say is honest and it's sure. Before that, beyond that, it's mystery. The answer is, there is no evidence or explicit evidence in the scriptures. Lots of tangential evidence, incidental things, that would point, yeah, it's fitting that Our Lady was born without original sin. Do you know what St. Thomas Aquinas taught? So this is in the uh, 13th century, so 1224 to 1225 to 1274 he lived. And about the Immaculate Conception, he thought Mary was not immaculately conceived. He, sorry? It was Don No, St. Thomas Aquinas, oh, yeah, yeah. the angelic doctor yeah. and the common doctor. Uh, so, you know, probably certainly one of the greatest, if not the greatest mind the church has ever produced and one of the greatest in the history of the world. But why did he say that Our Lady, she, he thought that at three months, Our Lady was became immaculate because the biology in those days wasn't what it is now and they thought that ensoulment happened at three months which happens those of you who've had children what happens at three months the baby starts to move quickening so he thought okay that's uh and it's a great thing you know you feel it sometimes the baby's kicking you know and uh yeah yeah just a point about that, that's when the placenta has formed and the baby becomes an individual sort of thing. Up to that stage, which is three months, um, there's sort of like a more of a connection with the mother. But at three months, the placenta is formed properly. Yes. And the child is like an individual. So I can understand that. Absolutely, yeah. There are a few but things that happen around 12 months, though, as well. Yeah, but the, the, the quickening, the, the movement, at yeah. least from what they was known yeah, back then, yeah, was about the three month mark. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And but the child has been an individual, I mean, already in most mm. cases mm. from conception, although up to 14 days, there's still a chance of twinning. So that's why we don't know mm. whether there's one soul or two. That's why the church is teaching on any conception is to treat it with the sacredness of human life. And uh, even though there may be, for instance, sometimes it's like a, a growth. Some of the, um, in the obstetricians museums or whatever, apparently there are, Anyway, um, growths that have been grown in the womb, but not actually a human being. It was um, like a tumor, for instance, and then the woman had just ejected it. So, but it's to, it's always to be treated with the sacredness as, as if it's a human being, mm -hmm. you know. But anyway, so that was the biology in the 13th century that there that quickening. So St. Thomas said that's when Our Lady was immaculately was was in fact free from original sin because the soul was thought to be infused into the body at that time. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the church has taught, no, she was conceived from the very moment of conception uh, that she is actually free from sin. Now, where therefore, if this knowledge doesn't come from the, uh, doesn't come from, I'm gonna finish this and then we'll have a little break. Uh, if this knowledge doesn't come from sacred scripture, well, where's the other source of divine revelation coming from? The Holy Spirit. Well, it is the Holy Spirit, but he also inspired the scriptures too. So can we be more specific yet? Tradition. Sacred tradition, correct. Sacred tradition. And the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council, in its document, De Verbum, I'll write that down, but worth reading. Well, they're all worth reading. But um, it talks about this debate and... And the, the fathers of Vatican II, there's about 3,000 of them, so they're the bishops around the world with the Pope uh, at the time, John, St. John the Twenty-Third, and St. Paul the VI, uh, they verbum said, there are two sources of divine revelation, sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and then the, with a third, the magisterium interprets them faithfully. 
and under, so that word is very important that the magisterium is the one who interprets them faithfully and magisterium comes from a Latin word meaning teacher, magister uh, so in other words it's authoritative and whenever you have doubts whenever you have confusion whenever the light of human reason reasoning isn't sufficiently clear to bring about a resolution or the matter is too complex to bring about a resolution what do we do? We appeal to authority. Two children and a family arguing, no, you started it, you did, you know, and mum or dad comes to intervene, okay, tell me the story, and the other one butts in and said, no, stop. But she knows now, or he knows, that there's something the other one is lying about, or uh, because their brother or sister, whoever. Anyway, eventually you come to some kind of understanding, but the authority of the parents resolves the dispute. So too in the church. The authority is resolved by the magisterium. The, the problem is resolved by the authority of the magisterium. And because the, the, the fathers were divided, though, some said, well, is the is tradition on the one hand and